Blog Talk Radio. Yo, Bantan. ¿Cuál es la palancha? ¿Qué es lo que está sonando por ahí? Pardo, ahí no hay que decir que decir que. Acabo de llegar a mi país. Chua, voy a estar ahí. ¡Ah! ¿Dónde llega a mi país? Uy, ¿y qué es lo que yo escucho por ahí? Eh, rapeadores que están pegados, tan sonados. ¿Cómo va a ser? Con puro ritmo baiteado. Acabo de llegar a mi país. Uy, ¿y qué es lo que yo escucho por ahí? Eh, rapeadores que están pegados, tan sonados. ¿Cómo va a ser? Con puro ritmo baiteado. Ellos son pura copia, copia, copia. Siempre fotocopia. El mismo rintón, pero desde otro no queda. Enredando a la gente con esa masofia. Así que flow de paquete en directo de copia. Copia, copia, copia. A mí no me interesa. De donde tu flow, si que le a la pereza. Ay, mamá. Escribí que eso da de tristeza A estas alturas se ve esta herida Son pura copia y no son inéditos Quieren ranking y sin méritos No tienen referencia ni créditos Y no pueden salir del crédito No son profesionales porque su ritmo lo pagan en Ares Son pura copia, no son originales Dice que apumantan cantando las reales Haciendo los fieles Acabo de llegar a mi país Uy, y que lo que yo escucho por ahí Rapeadores que están pegados, tan sonados, como va a ser con puro ritmo baiteado. Acabo de llegar a mi país, uy, y que es lo que yo escucho por ahí. Rapeadores que están pegados, tan sonados, como va a ser con puro ritmo baiteado. Se denominan artistas, será de tercera clase, cuarta o quinta. Veo con revistas para ver si por fin pueden distraer su vista. Se denominan artistas, será de tercera clase. De cuarta o quinta, peor con perrecitas Para ver si por fin puede distraer su vista Esto no es fake, tampoco bulé Y lo que escuchas es real reggae Tú sabes cuál es la que es Y no escuchas la mic y no pasa con una plena red Así me dice mi entrenador Cada vez que estamos en el ring tirando trompón ser tú mismo es lo mejor, nada de copia, eso es poca Acabo de llegar a mi país, uy, y que lo que yo escucho por ahí, ey, rapeadores que están pegados, tan sonados, como va a ser, con puro ritmo baiteado, acabo de llegar a mi país, uy, y que lo que yo escucho por ahí, ey, rapeadores que están pegados, tan sonados, como va a ser, con puro ritmo baiteado, El mismo rintón, pero desde otro no queda Enredando a la gente con esa masofia Así que flow de paquete en directo de Sofia Copia, 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 a mí no me interesa De donde tu flow, así que deja la pereza Y vamos a escribir que son de tristeza A estas alturas, que está Acabo de llegar a mi país, uy, y que lo que yo escucho por ahí Rapeadores que están pegados, tan sonados Como va a ser, con puro ritmo baiteado Acabo de llegar a mi país, uy, y que lo que yo escucho por ahí Welcome to the Jeff Mayweather Radio Show, uh, brought to you, as always, by Pro Boxing Insider. Jeff will be uh, joining us momentarily, and tonight we are uh, pleased to have a very special guest uh, with us tonight, um, Maureen Shea. Uh, Maureen, are you there tonight? Are you there, Mo? Whoops, I got to click you on. Can you hear me? <laughs> there yeah, you here. go. <laughs> All right, how you doing tonight, Mo? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Oh, it's been an absolutely crazy day. I just, I kind of have my computer half hooked up here. We're moving, and it's, it's uh, absolutely crazy. Uh, Jeff will okay. be on here in just a few seconds, and uh, we'll welcome him on. Um, great to have you. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get Jeff on here in just a second, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, go over the latest events here. Get the, get people to know you uh, a little bit about you. Oh, there he is. Let me click him on right here. And there is the star of the show, Jeff Mayweather. How are you doing tonight, buddy? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> All right, you forget about us? Yeah, sorry. What's that? I said, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I had a little time change there, and now you're probably dozing off. <laughs> Can you hear me, Jeff? Yes, I hear you. I'm at a party. 
Yeah, so you got a party going on there? Uh, I'm party, man. <laughs> well, hey, we're Jeff, joined you. Brought her on. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, we have Maureen Shea joined us, uh, Jeff. Um, she's on with us right now. Hi, Jeff. How Hi. are you? I'm fine. Are you still? Uh, very good, very good. <laughs> Happy to be oh. on. Yeah. All right, well, first things first, let's, uh, um, we're going to go ahead and talk about Maureen a little bit. For those of the, those that don't know her, um, Maureen Shea is known a little bit as uh, the real million dollar baby. So, so why don't you explain, Maureen, a little bit about how you came across that name. I know obviously came from the work on the movie. So let the folks know a little bit about how you, you know, how you got the name. Well, it's really funny because I just went over the story the other day with somebody, um, with the women in the boxing in the Olympics now. You know, I was an amateur. Oh. And um, I only had 12 amateur fights. Uh, I started boxing, uh, competing it when I was 21. And um, I turned pro when I was 24. But during that time, uh, Hillary Swank had come to Gleason's gym when I was training in Brooklyn, when I was training with Hector Roca. And she started training with Hector uh, for the movie. And uh, Hector paired me with her. And we, we were, I was her, spar, her primary sparring partner to get her ready in preparation for the movie. And I spent, you know, a significant amount of time with her, and she got to know me, and I shared a lot of my life, and uh, she she studied me for the character, and, you know, um, just a lot about just getting to know more about women's boxing, not just myself, but she spoke to other women, but, um, you know, just, we, we spent most of the time together. So when I turned pro, I think it was my fourth pro fight. It's funny, I never really had a fight name. I'm from the Bronx, New York, so people call me the Bronx Bombshell, uh, kind of, you know, I'm autographed after Alex Ramos, the Bronx Bomber. So um, I went... I was in, uh, I was, I was fighting in San Antonio, Texas, and I was on Evander Holyfield's undercard, and he was fighting Fresno Kendo, and uh, they, they announced me at the weigh-ins as the real Million Dollar Baby, and the name stuck, so uh, that's what, that's what people knew me as. But yeah, I, I was, basically, I was the, the primary sparring partner for Hillary for that movie, and uh, just spent a lot of time with her, and, and um, honored to be a part of, of an amazing, amazing film. You know, Jeff has worked a little bit in in movies too, as 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 far as uh, you know the boxing aspect. What's what's the difference between you know actually sparring and then when you're sparring with someone like Hillary, who, you know, you you obviously have to take a little easy on her. Well, um, I mean, I always had a control to kind of like you know like I I knew I I spar with different types of people. And, and I never, I, I applied pressure. I mean, you know, Jeff, how it is when you're in there and you're working. When somebody's hitting you, I mean, if I hit her back and I hurt her, what's that going to do for me? You know, this is, we're working on something. So I worked on my moves, certain things I was working for because I was fighting in the AM, I was fighting in the Golden Gloves in New York. So I said, okay, she's going to throw a bunch of punches at me. I'm just going to use my, work on my defense, work on my countering. But to make her feel the fight, I would pressure her a little bit. Now, and I also read that you, you would have, uh, you know, this would be kind of a, a source of contention between you two here. You worked quite a bit, I guess, sparring with Victor Ortiz. Um, what are your thoughts on him as a fighter? Uh, well, I, I worked um, just, I, I'm, in this, I'm out of the same camp as Victor. Um, as a fighter, I think Victor's, you know, he's, he's a tough kid. He's, um, he's really, when I first met him, I wasn't sure because, you know, I trained in, in Gleason's and I had tons of world champions that I've met. I tra trained around a lot of guys. And I just watch. I just like to sit back and observe and see how they are. Um, Victor was so welcoming, so humble, such a nice guy, respectful, um, and just very welcoming. And, um, you know, I see how he trains. He trains very, very hard. Uh, there's almost a um, – uh, he, he's got this youthfulness about him. Uh, even in the gym, he has fun. He loves what he does. Um, but that youthfulness is still there. You know, even at 25, 26 years old, it's nice to see that. Um, but I think I – think, uh, I think Victor is. I think he's a, he's a good fighter. Um, I think that um, for me personally, I feel like it's the emotional, you know, in there. Something's going on in there in his head when he's fighting. In my opinion, I think when he's got it together, he's solid. But then something happens, whether it's frustration, whether it's I don't know what it is, but you know, a lot of stuff. I mean, as a fighter, and Jeff knows a lot of stuff's going on in your head when you're in a fight. You're thinking a trillion thoughts at one time, and. If something's unsettling, you know, you can react to it. And sometimes sure. in the recent fights with Victor, um, from what I've seen, I, I wonder if there's something unsettling with him mentally, um, you know, unsettling with his psychological right now. Because in the gym, I don't see it. I'll be honest. I don't see it. But when you're under that pressure and in that ring, and that's not to say he's not a great champion and not that he's not going to be a champion again. It's, this is part of the fight. People don't realize that the fighting in the ring is just one of the fights. 
The main fight is outside of the ring. What you go through, even in your sleep as fighters, we fight in our sleep. You know, we have so much going on and trying to compose all of that to enter that squared circle, to get in there and just put everything together in front of millions of people with the amount of added pressure. You know, obviously that's the stage that we've stepped up to and that's a responsibility that we have and we're ready for it. But we're human and people forget about that. So you have to learn to battle that, conquer that, and be able to um, maintain that balance in the ring when you're fighting. And I'm sure Victor's looking to try to work on that. Now, Jeff, you know, you, you've been you're pretty critical of the past about, you know, Victor, not necessarily about his skills, but the same thing like Mo was saying, you know, about his, you know, maybe his, his willingness to fight or the mental aspect of it. Um, you know, do you agree with what she said? And, and do you think there's anything that he can do, you know, if, if you were training him, what you would instruct him to do to help him maybe get past the, the mental aspect as opposed to the physical? Well, I mean, I think that she hit, you know, she hit the, she hit the middle on the head. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, as a fighter, you know, you do have a lot of mental things going on inside your head. And, and with Victor, I mean, it just seems like to me at – at certain points in the fight, he just fall apart, and you know, and I don't know, I don't know if anybody can fix that, you know. But um, I mean, because you know, I've, I've seen it in you know at least three fights, and he, and the one thing, and the other thing that I see from him that it, it kind of, you know, it, it kind of amazes me, but it, in a in a wrong way. I mean, when Victor loses. He looks as though he's the happiest person in the world that just lost. You know, I don't understand that. I mean, he did the same thing with Madonna. He did the same thing with Floyd. He did the same thing with, you know, with um, this last fight. You know, it was like, oh, okay, okay. You know, and I mean, and even more so, you know, I mean, and then like you said, the mental aspect of it. This fight was, after the fight was over with Floyd in the, in the uh, post-fight conference, I mean, I don't even know what he's talking about. He's talking about, yeah, Floyd needs me. Floyd needs to fight me again. I'm the, I'm the money. I'm the person that everybody wants to see. Yeah, you, you, something must have got rattled in your brain. You know, that has nothing to do with pop. You know, but, I'm, but like I said, I mean, to me, he has quit in him. You know, I right. mean, he's shown it. He's shown it more than once. Even in this fight, you're winning. If you're winning, I don't care. Just stay on your bicycle, do what you got to do to survive. You know, you don't necessarily have to take no punches. You know, you don't even necessarily have to even throw any punches. He was so far ahead that all he had to do was dance around for three rounds. You know, and any other right. fighter, you know, they would, you know, the rest we would have to stop the fight. You Can know, I ask you, I have a question for you, is, Jeff. I have a quick question regarding that. I have a question for you. Um, regarding that, because I've been through this myself in a fight where I just wonder what his corner, what his trainer was, what Danny Garcia was telling him to do. Now, I've been in fights where my, my trainer, when I was training with Hector Roca, he was giving me instruction, and I disagreed with his instruction, but I, I mm -hmm. felt like, and I, 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 but I did what he told me to do, and I don't necessarily feel it was right. At what point does a fighter should a fighter decide not to listen to the corner and to do instinctually what they feel in there, or should that be automatic? No, I mean I think that that's that's automatic. I think that's that's okay. like autopilot, you know. Because okay. I mean the one thing is this: in a situation like that, automatically, even if your corner doesn't tell you, but I can understand his corner not telling him, basically mm -hmm. to stay away. You got to fight one, you know. Mm -hmm. But. I mean, even if you just occasionally throwing a jab or something like that, because, I mean, he was so far ahead that you mm -hmm. don't quit. You quit at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was like quitting for him was like, it was like second nature. And that's one thing I know in life is this. Once you mm -hmm. quit, it becomes easy. It mm -hmm. becomes easy and easy and easy. I mean, because I, I even had a, a time in my life, I remember, um, this is when I was, in, I was in high school. I was playing basketball. And no, I wasn't in high school. I was in middle school, and I quit the basketball team. And my coach told me, he said, yeah, he said, why'd you quit? I said, because I didn't feel like I was getting treated fair. He said, you know what? You're going to become a quitter for the rest of your life. Uh -huh. I didn't know what he was talking about at that time because it didn't matter. That was just one thing that I decided to quit. And, it, and you know, and 
I never thought about it again. But the next time another coach, you know, scold me, I quit. And the next time, I quit. It became so easy for me to quit because I would rather just quit. It became comfortable. Than, it became comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Right. It became it became my easy way out because it was like this. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not going to play by your rules. If you you know if you can't con- you know if you can't comply with my rules, I don't need to be here anyway. You know, and and that you know and that became it became a part of my life until I got to a point where, you know. I mean, when I was in high school, it just, it just became so easy for me to quit. And then, of course, like, by the time I got to, like, when I was in college, that whole concept of, you know, quitting and stuff, I understood it, and I understood the magnitude of it. So, I mean, well, now, never again that you, happened for me. Jeff, you had your brothers around at this time. You know, obviously, you guys were all really competitive. So how, how did they react to your quitting? No, it, it didn't matter because I was in school. I quit I quit school. um uh, Activities. I didn't quit. I never quit in boxing ever. Well, I know that, but didn't they give you a hard time for quitting in general? I mean, you know, they were your bigger brothers, so I didn't know if they, you know, maybe give you some no, advice or, or how they reacted to it. No, because they never even they never even participated in, in school sports. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's hard funny, Jeff. I can I can relate to that in, in a funny way. I, I played a million different sports and I quit every sport too when I was in grammar school and high school and I got kicked out of high school. But I quit everything but I never quit in boxing. Boxing's the only sport I never quit in. And you know what? Well, yeah. and, that, and what you're saying is true. That's the exact thing for me because I was in a fight where I had two broke hands. And and I continued to fight. I continued to fight. You know, to the end. I mean, because, I mean, I was winning the fight, but I was in the guy's backyard. You know, I was defending my title. So, basically, it was a situation where, you know, I know that I won the first six rounds. Easy. You know, but I ended up losing the fight in a majority decision, which, mm-hmm. you know, it was not hard anyway to beat the guy in his hometown, but I wasn't going to give up my title by... It was, yeah, you did you know, what you did for you, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, going to. No, go ahead, Jeff. Finish. No, no, I just said I wasn't going to give up my title by quitting. All right. Uh-huh. right. Now, Maureen, you know, kind of the quitting theme here. Um, you know, it, it's really hard being a, a, a woman in in, in boxing. Um, you know, obviously, you got a little bit of a you know a boost from from you know the million dollar million dollar baby thing. But you know, explain this a little bit. You know. What's it like being in a sport where you just, you know, you continually strive to get recognized and, and get appreciated for what you do? I mean, all the hard hours you put in, and still it's really, really hard for women, you know, to, to really get a foothold and, and get respected in, in, in the boxing world. You know, I, I, I try to I try to approach everything with a, with a positive, you know, with a positive. And I, I never looked at myself for a while. I mean, even now, now with the Olympics, obviously, but I never looked at myself as a woman in boxing. I said, you know what, I'm just like everybody else. Cause I've seen some guys in the gym. I'm like, I train harder than them. I spar harder than them. I have better technique than some of them. I've seen them quit. I never quit. I fought with a deviated septum, you know, all these other things. And I'm like, there's no difference between me and him. So that's how I looked at myself. The problem I see, and I actually just came across an article that actually infuriated me. And I very rarely get um, emotional. I mean, I'm an emotional person, but I really, I learned in, in getting older and, and trying to be more mature, I learned to step back and just, like, look at something and not react right away because I reacted all the time when I was a kid. I mean, that's why I got kicked out of high school, fights in the street, my family, whatever, getting kicked out of the house because I reacted emotionally to everything. Now, in this situation, this, this writer wrote an article about the women in the Olympics. And it was a really, it was a well-written article about the women. It was great. But then he went on to say how the women professionals are considered a carnival and a sideshow. And they were considered. And now these women in the Olympics are real athletes. How they're striving for something where there's no monetary gain. And how they're educated. And they're putting their lives out there and sacrificing. And in my opinion, the article came across as very ignorant, what he wrote. Because I felt this individual did not do his research, and I was I was just infuriated. And I actually sent him a message on Twitter. I said I'd love to sit down with him and better inform him about women's professional boxing because I have a degree. I have a degree, um, a BA in English. Um, I've, I've I've sacrificed. I moved three thousand miles away to to chase my dream and to produce produce uh, you know pursue something. And in, in in the finances that women gain in the pros is a joke. 
is a joke. So if, there, if we're chasing right. the money, there's no money to be made. I can do anything else in this world if I wanted to. I gave up a very well-paying job because I love boxing and I have something that I'm not done with. And I want to continue doing what I'm doing until God lets me know, okay, Maureen, it's time. And I will still, I will live the way that I'm living, sacrificing, making the adjustments until that day comes when I can say, okay, I'm done. You know, I don't know when that's going to be. My problem is with the, with the difficulty lies with the media. The thing is, is that the media, I mean, we get... It's great. We have our boxing shows. We have our boxing channels. And I love to get on. I love to talk to the press. I got tons of press with Million Dollar Baby. I was an amateur at the time. And, you know, that was great. But that was because the press, it was a story. So they wanted to follow it. I feel some of the promoters out there don't know how to promote a woman. They don't know how to do it. They, I, when I fought on Top Rank's card with Bob Arum, Bob Arum, we were talking, you know, and, and he had me at the press conferences, and Miguel Cotto, I addressed the media in English and in Spanish. The same media that was there interviewing Cotto stayed and interviewed me. Now, that was the boxing media. It was great. Now, these promoters put these fighters on this, these other platforms in, uh, in Hollywood. They send them to these different shows. They have them doing modeling stuff. They have them doing all these different things. They won't make that investment with the females, and I don't understand why, when it's, it's a low-risk investment, in my opinion. And I think that, um, you know, I don't know why there's such a black eye on it. You know, it, it's like you have educated women out there. You have women that can fight that have skill. I mean, every time I fought, and I'm not tooting my own horn here, but every time I fought, and I can have my fans call in, I've always gave, given a great show. And they've left like, that was the fight of the night. That was the fight of the night. Wow. And it's usually the shock value. Because they meet me, they hear me speak, they're like, wow, you don't look like a fighter. Then they see me fight, and they're like, you don't fight like a girl. I said, yes, I do. It just you can't you can't actually admit that a female actually fights like this. It's a skill. I'm an athlete. That's what it is. So do you think someone like like Marlon Esparza, who's getting a ton of you know national attention here with the women being Olympics, she's doing the McDonald's commercials, uh, Cover Girl or whatever. Um, do you think that's something that will have a positive effect on women's boxing, or do you think maybe that's you know like, like kind of like most Olympic deals, you know, it'll be real hot for a couple months and it'll kind of well, you know kind of drift think, away. I think it's great for Marlon. I think it's wonderful. Um, I think it depends what, what you're going to do with that. Um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, it's amateur boxing. And, and people need to understand, they still, people are so, like, some people don't know that, and, and the regular, the regular, regular everyday, you know, everyday person who isn't really familiar with boxing, especially the women, they'll see an empowering commercial like that with Marlene, and they'll be like, wow, and then they'll meet somebody like me and say, oh, but how come you're not in the Olympics? And I'm like, because I'm a pro. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, there's, it's a totally different sport, you know, like it's totally different, you know, and they're like, well, how many rounds do you fight? Oh, is it like the guys? I've educated so many fans that became fans of me because I've done speaking engagements and I've crossed over for myself, you know, with my team and gone into other avenues, especially with Billion Dollar Baby, you know, and I've educated a lot of people on women's boxing to know that it's the same as the men, you know, we just fight two-minute rounds, you know, and they're open to it. So hopefully... See, when articles are written like this one that I was talking about, when they're written like that, it bothers me because it's like, okay, thanks. So what are you trying to say? You know, educate yourself. Do your research. Figure things out before you go and write something like that because that, the people reading these articles are regular, everyday people that aren't necessarily boxing people or boxing fans that really understand the sport. And now you have an individual that's not even explaining the difference between professionals and amateurs. Basically what he's saying is that it's a carnival and a sideshow. And that's like, that doesn't help. That doesn't help me. Right. It makes my job harder. Now I have to go and I have to be the big mouth that I am and speak the way I'm speaking right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say you're, you're not, not, not shy, that's for sure. Um, Jeff, <laughs> so you, you trained, uh, you know, Melissa Littlejohn, you, you know, she's, she's a beast in the gym. You know, you're, you're around Jessica Riccosi, Layla, McCar Layla McCarter a little bit. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on this, the, the women's sport? Anything you think they can do to, to gain recognition, or is it just something that you, you think maybe, you know, culture, you know, a sport that's dominated by male viewers are just never going to embrace the women going at it? Well, I think that, you know, that them being in the Olympics will empower the sport because I think that <clears throat> now there's going to actually be promoters that are going to be looking for those female fighters that happen to maybe medal or even look good in the Olympics. <clears throat> and I think that that's imperative for the sport of women's boxing because one thing about it is this. Women's boxing was basically, at one point in time, predicated on the names of the former champions 
who happen to have daughters. And that's when women boxing, that, right, that's when women boxing was at its highest. And it seemed like everybody um, is basically a part of the sport almost at simultaneously. So women boxing just it just was almost like it became non existent. Because there was a time when women boxing was almost on every card at that time. They would put mm-hmm. a woman, you know, as a show fight or as you know, and a lot of times just like just like she said, a lot of times the woman's fight would actually be the fight of the night. You know, because they got a chance to showcase their, their ability and and like like you said, sometimes it's shock value because automatically just because of the fact that it's a woman, people don't think that they can, you know, they can deliver you know, their punches and, and you know, their technique the same way a man can, but but they can if they're you know, if they're <clears throat> if they're well trained, you know. And they make the same sacrifices we do. But it's just that right. like I said, at at that point in time, that's when women boxing was at its highest because they had name value. You know, you have where you have a Layla Ali, you have a, you know, a Frida Foreman, you have a um, Joe Frazier's daughter, you know, and Archie Moore's daughter, Duran's daughter, you know, everybody just coming out the woodworks, you know, and basically they're, you know, they're really making a name off their father's name, but that's good enough because now they got something to attach it to. It may be because that person is fighting, maybe their father will be in the audience, you know, and that adds to it as well. So, I mean, but, you know, like I said, then it seemed like all of a sudden boxing, women's boxing just basically pretty much just died in the United States, but it picked up over in Europe. Mm-hmm. Now, in Europe... And Mexico. I mean, and Mexico, Jeff. Big time in Mexico. Yeah, that's right. And in Mexico. You know, but mm-hmm. I mean, hope, hopefully now with the Olympics, it might not happen after this first Olympic, but I think that it is going to, women's boxing is going to be on the rise again. Because these women I, I now... Can't, I, oh. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I can't believe how actually how fast this half hour was. This is the fastest half hour I think we've ever had. Um, we just <laughs> got a minute left, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut it short on that. But uh, uh, Maureen, yeah, go ahead and tell us. you got a fight lined up here and where the folks can follow you and, and, and all that kind of good stuff. Well, actually, we're, we're working on a date right now in September, and um, uh, everybody, I don't have a date right now. I'm just, I'm waiting on that. I should get confirmation this week, but I'll definitely be tweeting about that. So, um, you know, everybody can follow me on Twitter, Maureen Shea. I'm on Instagram, Maureen underscore Shea, and uh, my Facebook, you can subscribe to my personal page. My fan base page hasn't been updated, but I, I run everything for my personal page. Um, and, you know, I love, I love, and the fans have any questions, because I, I just recently tweeted something. I said, you know, if anybody wants to tweet me uh, a question about women's professional boxing, if you need any, any insight or anything, let me know. You know, even the amateurs, you know, I have a lot of, I, you know, I've, I've been to sport for 12 years, and i got a little bit of experience, and, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm welcome to any, any questions or, or comments that anybody wants to make. Yeah, you're great at that. You definitely respond to all your tweets. So um, we really appreciate having you. Alex, I can't believe it. I can't believe how fast this uh, this show went. But anyway, uh, yeah, again, thanks, Maureen. Um, look forward to your fight, and we'll keep the folks updated uh, on Pro Boxing Insider. And, Jeff, we appreciate uh, you as well, and we will talk to you guys again next week. Anything else to add real thanks. quick? Anybody? Uh, Jeff, I just want to say it's great talking to you. I think, I think me and Jeff can sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk for about five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a date. <laughs> One day I'll have to get out to Vegas, and we'll have to do that for sure. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right. All right, guys, have a great night. God bless. All right, you too. Thanks, Mom. Bye-bye. Bye.